Okay, thanks for coming everybody uh, to the 16th Phototech Lecture. Today we're happy to have Lihi zelnik Manor from Caltech's Vision Lab to talk to us about multi-view image compositions. Lihi, take it away. Thank you. Um, so this talk today I'm going to present some things that we've been doing. Um, it's about ideas we had about how to compose images. Everything that you'll see takes place after the images have been taken. So this is not about the, uh, the process of capturing the pictures, but rather what do you do, what can you do with them afterwards? Okay, so this works. Um, so why do we take pictures? Many of us probably are here, so people just love having cameras and taking lots of pictures and having digital photography is even made that uh, an even uh, greater experience. We just go around and grab hundreds and thousands of pictures and usually we're just trying to capture memories. So it could be memories of a person or a place, an object, something that we found interesting. But just taking a single picture in many cases is insufficient. It's not, it's not a good representation of what we've been doing. I don't know how many of you find themselves just doing click, 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 click a few pictures uh, or just moving around and looking at the different pieces of the scene around you. Um, and just I put in here some, some comments, some citations from uh, Stephen Johnson. So there was this uh, symposium a few weeks ago in Berkeley and uh, Stephen Johnson, who's a great photographer said those things that memories are typically acquired over time in many moments and photography is often a concatenated experience so you don't just take a single picture you take a few uh, sometimes it's just you no know, you cannot capture the whole scene within a single shot because I'm, maybe you cannot move backwards and that's all the zoom that you have so you can take snapshots which are pieces of of the scene and then you want to somehow maybe organize them in a better way. Um, like here, I put them in the right place. So rather than being in a, each picture being in its, as a, appearing as a thumbnail, as a, in its grid slot, we put them in the right geometrical organization. And what, one such form that's very popular for organizing pictures is using panoramas. Uh, here I just took those four pictures that you saw in the previous slide, and we, uh, perfectly align them using some transformations. I will discuss that uh, a little bit uh, ahead. And then merge them and you get something which looks like a single bigger picture of the scene. Um, so why, why do we use such panoramas? Because um, regular photos, like you see this example, this is in the courtyard in our building. Um, you cannot capture much more than this, this single arch um, since the courtyard is closed. So when you stand here, this is more or less what you get with a single photo. Um, you could use fish eye to get more, but it's rather distorted, and then you can use tools to undistort the fish eye. Uh, alternatively, you can try and do something like that, which hopefully looks better, so it gives you a big, bigger uh, field of view, and it's not distorted. And obtaining things like that is the first thing I'm going to talk about today. So. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I'm con going to concentrate on panoramas, which are smooth-looking uh, image compositions. That, uh, and our goal is for them to look good. And this is very subjective, but I will try to convey what I mean when I say look good throughout the talk. So what's, what's the standard solution for, um, for panoramas? So this is uh, engineers or scientists, I don't know how you want to call uh, whoever worked on this problem, figured, okay, if we have, let's take the camera and put it on a tripod. Or if it's not on a tripod, if you're holding it, just don't move. You're not allowed to move your camera. The only thing you can do is rotate it. Now, if, the nice thing is that if you limit yourself to rotations, the geometry is very, very simple. Um, you can think of that as if you're taking, you have a sphere around you and you're just capturing pieces of that sphere. And then what you need to do is to restitch them on the sphere. And methods for doing that are readily available. You can download quite a few tools that do that. There is auto stitch, uh, panel tools, uh, a number of those. I uh, think like Canon cameras come out with uh, a tool for stitching, uh, stitching images, Photoshop. And most of them are based on the same idea. So the geometry is well known. It's 
uh, it's well defined. And then the details are in how do you actually do that. So typical methods will start with finding features like this point here and the corresponding point in the other image. Once you find enough of those, you can compute the transformation, how to align the, the images with respect to each other. And then you can stitch them on the sphere. Um, so this is something that's known. Uh, something that's not really uh, clear is once you stitch your images on the sphere, you get something that looks like that. How do you then open it back again into a single flat picture, which is uh, often what you want to obtain? So just uh, a note on that. So I think already in 1870 or so, there was, uh, I forget the name, but uh, the first panoramas were constructed and people would, uh, the panoramas were placed typically on a cylinder or a sphere, and you would walk into this, in your full body, you'll just walk into this big construction and look around you, and you will see, uh, you will see what you will see will look as if you were there in the original scene. This places you at the center of the sphere, and you're just looking around and seeing uh, as if you were in the real, in the real place. Um, when you come to computers, uh, this was replaced with things like QVTR, where you have, um, you're given just a small window, and you can rotate and look and go up and down, but you're actually just seeing, at each time, you're just seeing one piece of the sphere. You never see the whole sphere, and there are no issues. But if you want to see the whole scene, which could be 360 by 180 degrees, um, you need to flatten it. Uh, if you wanted to print it, if you want to send it to someone, um, just want to get a full view of what was there, you have to do this to take this step. And this step is not trivial. And anyone who ever tried to cut a, a ball and flatten it knows that it's impossible to do it without distorting the surface. So distortions are unavoidable. You cannot get um, a correct, nice, or a correct looking undistorted 2D image from a panorama. There must be distortions. The question is which kind of distortions you want to put in, uh, which ones you'd rather have, and how do you um, how do you mix them or choose between them? Now, the interesting thing is, at least within the, um, so I'm a computer vision person, at least in my field, and from what I know uh, within graphics, people haven't really touched on that. They just say, OK, let's do the standard things. Um, let, so I'll, I'll show what they, they've done. But what I'm going to explore two things. One is what cartographers do, because cartographers have map of the globe, and then they need to flatten it out, so they have the same problem, they, and they've solved it to some extent. And artists have also uh, tackled uh, the same problem of trying to represent scenes, complex scenes, on a 2D canvas. So the solutions that scientists gave us or, uh, are um, typically using uh, one of two types of projections. So the first one is perspective. And perspective projection takes just, um, do I have a, a pointer? I don't have a pointer. No, OK. So perspective projection just places a plane tangent to the sphere and then emanates ray from the center of the sphere. And the pixel here will go there, uh, and so forth. And this is what you'll get. This is very similar to what you actually, you're actually doing uh, when you're taking a picture, although you have some less distortions, so it's not exactly that, but more or less that. Um, but perspective, so, but perspective is very problematic. So perspective can only work up to some angles. It's like you can see here that it can at most do 180 degrees, and when you go to 180 degrees field of view, this plane will have to extend all the way to infinity and things will be completely smeared. Now, if you were to stand right there at the center of the sphere and look at this plane, even though it extends to infinity, it would look exactly as it should. But typically, we're not stand there. Typically, once you have the picture, you can be at any distance from it. Um, and these are, so this is a very famous picture taken by, that was shown by Piran. This is a sphere in reality, and it looks completely distorted when you take a photograph of it. Um, this is a little reconstruction that we made. So just we, we took five pictures of the same person just standing in 
letting the camera rotate so this, the face is in the four corners. And this is what the face should look like, but this is what it com comes out in the photograph there. It comes really distorted because of perspective. Now, if you, if you were to move close here and look at it, it will look good. It's only once you're far away and you're not at the center of projection, it's as if rather than standing here, you're standing here, and then things just look distorted. So that's perspective. Um, another one that I just I grabbed from Time magazine, I think yesterday or the day before, and I don't know if it's that noticeable, but I think the heads are somewhat elongated. And um, I couldn't find a better one yesterday. But typically, when you go in, if you look at Time magazine, whenever they have people that like taking the photographs a little bit from below, and when there are lots of people standing and their heads are the corners are towards the extremes of the picture, you can find them looking oval shapes. So this is perspective. Uh, with panoramas, when we, since we have wide field of view, this is typically not a good solution. Um, and here, just a little summary. So if you stand in the center of projection, you're good. But people tend to move around the picture or move that picture, and it doesn't look that great. Another projection that's been used is called cylindrical. And this one is actually is like you take your sphere, you wrap a cylinder around it. And the simplest one just says, OK, let's take every angle, theta, every horizontal angle, and map it to a column in our final image. And every vertical degree will be a row. And then you can choose also finer resolutions. But um, you maintain the aspect ratio of angles. Uh, this one is called cylindrical projection, uh, I think also rectangular and equidistance. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the de details. Um, and this is what you will get from it. So this is a set, we took a set of pictures. We, we stitched them into a panorama on the sphere. And when you flatten the sphere using cylindrical projection, this is what you get. So vertical lines look straight, because vertical lines on the sphere are vertical lines on the real world. And when you put your cylinder around it, they remain vertical. Horizontal lines are bent um, because they were not, well, they were, so horizontal lines in the real world are like um, latitude lines on the sphere. And then when you project them, they open, they, they, they bend. So this is what you get with cylindrical. And this is, by the way, this is the, the common projection with most panorama tools that you will find online. Uh, this is the projections that are typically being used, not perspective. Perspective just cannot co cover um, wide fields of view. And if you have buildings and structured things, you will notice the distortions. If you just have scenery with mountains, and maybe here you'll have grass, and at the top you'll have sky, you won't notice the distortions. The distortions are mostly at the bottom and the top. The center looks good. The distortion is less prominent there. And this is just. Uh, summary of what happens. So the center looks good. Um, horizontal lines are more or less kept horizontal. Aspect ratios are more or less kept uh, properly. As you move far away from the horizon, things are, get more distorted. Um, but cartographers came up with other, there are numerous uh, projections. And uh, one of them, for example, is Mercator, which is very similar to sorry, to the rectangular one that we saw before. The, so the previous one was just theta in the horizontal direction and phi, the vertical angle in the vertical direction. This one just takes the vertical direction and stretches it a little bit, so aspect ratios are maintained. It's a conformal mapping. It was, it was really important for cartographers to be able to navigate properly using a map. Um, it's not that crucial for us for things to be conformal, although um, for example, this gives you a shows you the difference between the two. So while here there's, so this is a panorama of the Pantheon, and the, sh the little shaft at the ceiling is a circular shaft. It's perfectly circular. And with the rectangular projection, it looks, uh, it looks squished, while with the Mercator, it, looks, it maintains its correct aspect ratio. So these are different differences between different projections that you could choose. Maybe, but in some cases, you could choose something else. So maybe transfer Mercator, which is just takes the Mercator and transposes it. Uh, in this case, the, ver the horizontal lines will be kept uh, horizontal. Vertical lines are bent. Now, in most cases, when you have 
people, when they take panoramas, they tend to move more right left. This is just the way we are used to well, capture out the world, look at it. Uh, so this is not a good option, but uh, if you do want to take panoramas which are more elongated uh, up down, then this, the transverse mercator could be a better choice. So here I cropped only so you see only the visible area, but you can see that you can see the legs of the photographer all the way to the top, uh, and everything looks straight while here uh, the horizontal lines are bent and here as well. There are many such projections, and uh, you could very easily implement all of them, play with them, choose the ones that you like. Uh, here you see the full view. So the previous uh, visualizations, I just cropped the part which is full. Here you see black parts because we didn't have the full sphere when you took the pictures. So there are things that are left. And you can see what happens with each, uh, with each projection. So this is Mercator, perspective. You see the, the huge distortion, and it's, it's cropped because beyond that, it just got too much distorted. Uh, and stereographic, postel, and there's a book by Snyder with all those projections. And you can actually come up with good heuristics on which one you would like to use depending on the scene content and depending on the geometry of the, of the panorama, like the angles and so forth. So that would be one option that you can look at. Um, we were looking at something slightly different. We said, OK, we like the cylindrical projections because they capture wild fields of view. but they're somewhat distorted in an unnatural way. They bend horizontal lines. Um, perspective feels better when the field of view is not that wide. So let's try and see if we can do something which gives us both. It looks like perspective, but still captures wide fields of view. And artists have been doing that for many years. So even though people tend to think that um, perspective has been known already since the Renaissance days, and most artists can, can draw using correct perspective, they don't, many of them don't do that. So like this example, which has multiple viewpoints, and you can find ma many others which are not correct geometrically. And what's being done in many of those, in a sense, is rather than taking the sphere and placing just one plane and projecting onto it, you put the f multiple tangent planes, and then you just open them like an origami. Um, now, each plane is, has perspective projection, so, so it looks good. The big distortion will be at the intersection of such planes. But this distortion is often very nicely hidden, like in paintings. You, like any distortion here won't be noticeable because it's just kind of greenish, yellowish. You don't know what's going on there. So you can change the viewpoint. Um, but this was also used a lot in Chinese scrolls where you have views of the city from side view and then top view, and they just change between viewpoints freely. And you don't care. You look at it, and it looks fine. Um, so what does it mean for panoramas? So given a panorama, what we need to do is mark, maybe. So rather than having placing the cylinder, we're going to put um, how we call it, parallelogram, we will call it. How we call it? OK, so you put a parallelogram around your sphere. You will wrap it with a set of planes. Um, you need to find those vertical lines where you're going to cut the planes, and then you will unfold it. And the trick part is actually find, choosing those uh, intersection points between the planes to be nicely hidden. So for example, here, there are natural vertical lines at the intersections between the walls. And you can get this result, which looks um, rather believable. You don't have any bending of lines. And the distortions here, there are distortions, but they're um, not that evidence. So here, just a comparison. At the top, you see the cylindrical projection with the bending of lines. And here, you see the multi the multi-plane projection, which shows you everything. Um, if you see, I know if the quality is good enough, but this st sculpture, for example, is distorted. Uh, you can see there. So there is some funny shape here. So maybe this was not the best choice for a cut. But maybe, I don't know. So this is what you pay for having this. Um, a few more examples. Um, it's just the machine shop in Caltech. And the building is, is a standard rectangular building. It's not, it's not a, a round building. And the top of the cylindrical projection, you could think this is a round building, but it's not. It's just, and here I hid the, so I hid the multiple plane, the, the intersection between the planes, I think, more or less here. 
And since there's, this is just a homogeneous region with a road, you just don't notice it. it you don't see it. It looks smooth. Uh, another one with a sculpture, and you can see the difference. Uh, so here I hid, I, there's a plane here and another plane for the sculpture. And you can see that here the legs of the photographer are, are shown in nice distortion proportions. Here there, you don't see them because they, just, they got smeared so much by the cylindrical projections that I cut them out. Another example, and another one in our courtyard. Um, again, I think like if you look at this cylindrical projection, it just looks as if there's, the arches are within a big arch, but they're not. This, is, this part is straight. This looks more realistic. Um, one thing that happens with this projection is that uh, even though you can use, um, you, you don't need to use that many planes to fit perspective. So perspective looks good up to 45, 50 degrees. Uh, people still look bad in, uh, in such viewing angles. Like this guy you see is, is somewhat uh, stretched in a funny way. He's a very skinny person. He shouldn't look like that. And that's also something that has been known for a long time. Here's, here's another, another example. So these are, five, this was, these are five frames from a video. Uh, this is one of my sons, and I was just tracking him while he was running and making fun of me. And s stitching those so that the background is aligned and then showing you what he would look like in each of those frames. You see that his head is stretched to the right here, um, another shape here. This one is more or less realistic. Here is a, he is at the center of projection, and this is what he looks like. He doesn't look like the other ones. Um, and we don't want that. We want him to look good in all of them. Now, this has been noticed by artists for a long time. So if you look at Renaissance paintings, most of them don't give the same treatment to the background and the foreground. Many of the paintings are draw, use uh, perspective to draw the architecture and the structures in the scene. And people are just pasted on the scene in complete just not obeying any correct geometrical uh, constraints. Like, for example, look here. Uh, there's a little ball here. And if you enlarge this region, you will see that it's perfectly spherical. Well, it should be somewhat oval if this is perspective projection. And there are many other examples of that. So we said, OK, if this is good for painters. Why, not, why can't we do the same thing? We have all those great digital. Uh, uh, tools, we can take uh, pictures and do the same. And this is another version of doing those multi-planes. So in this case, the background will be just one plane, and then the ball will have just will be painted as if you, we attached a little tangent plane here, and then it's just placed in the right spot on the big canvas of the background. How do we? We can do the same thing with images. So just taking those five images, we cut them out. And you can do that either automatically using uh, or, or semi-automatically using Photoshop or GIMP. And that's what I did in this case. So there are intelligent scissors that let you cut out the people very easily, very quickly. Um, in this case, I also I filled in the background. The fill in is not perfect. So I have a separation of background, background and foreground of the original pictures. This is not crucial. It's just. Um, it just, was just used to generate the background panorama, which is not perfect. But now I'm going to put back, um, put back the, the little guy uh, in all the occurrences. And what I did to put him back now is rather than put him in the correct perspective projection, I just took those images where I see him at the center of projection and pasted them on top of the panorama. And, Look at that for a comparison. So look at his head here and his head there and here and there. Um, I think the difference is, is vivid. And just what you see at the top matches more. So typically, when we look at the scene, we turn our head. So we always see the person at the center of projection. That's what this person should look like. He should not be distorted. And that's why this is more, uh, I, I believe at least, this is a better fit to what one would like to see than, than this is. Um, just another example, so uh, the top is cylindrical. 
Uh, cylindrical, by the way, doesn't distort the people that much, but it does distort the background. So you can uh, fuse the multiple planes and place the people, paste the people like, on top of it, and they tend to look better. Uh, another one, this one is really extreme. So he's, so he's very tall, so that's why he got that distorted. So I was sitting low, and he's 6'5". So he was just at the right at the corner of the panorama, and he got really distorted. And pasting him makes him look normal. And this other guy that we saw before again, so the final. So, well, so this is what a standard panorama tool will give you nowadays. And this is what we're saying. Maybe you want to look at doing something like that. It, right now, it requires some manual intervention, but not intensive. And you can like, get things that look somewhat better. And we are also working on automating that. It's doable to some extent. So, um, so what I showed you so far, I believe, convinced you that we can have multiple viewpoints in a single panorama. And it doesn't look bad. In fact, in many cases, it looks, it looks rather good. Um, so then we decided, yes? So a, a question. Um, when you did the, the, the shot of your son moving by, you had multiple frames overlap. Right. OK, so actually, here, I'll show you. I haven't used the other frames to fill in the background. What I used is um, um, texture propagation. And I used one of the older algorithms. So this one is from 99. It's not as good. And this is why, this is why you have such artifacts. But there are methods which just take a hole in an image and do in painting in kind of a smart way. You do it pick. Um, you can think of, I can give you a very, uh, just the intuition. So say you have a hole. You choose a pixel which is on the boundary of the hole. So you have some part of the neighborhood you do have, only one part is missing. And then you look in your image for other regions that look, that at least the, the area that you, the piece that you do have looks the same. Then you copy that pixel from there. And you propagate that. And you can optimize it. And you could get better things than that. Um, in most cases, um, I didn't, I didn't even need to do that, or, or maybe just a little bit. So what happens? What, why did I, do I need to do that? Um, let me show you another example. Like here. So um, the reason you need the background propagation is since he's going to capture less than he did before, and you just need to fit in these areas. So either you saw them in other pictures, which is very common, because we're talking about panoramas. So you do see things. Uh, and if you haven't, you just use that. But yeah, it could be it could be a problem. So not so not only from from video we have this issue. Don't see with multiple frames. Uh, typically, also the leftovers are so are not that big, so the texture propagation doesn't need to be that great. But you're right. Okay, so everything we saw so far looks smooth and nice. But we forgot one thing. The camera needs to stand in place. It can only rotate. You cannot translate. And um, sometimes you want to do that. right? You're, we're free people. We want to move around. It could be either because we want to avoid obstacles. Like here, there is this pole in front of the building. And if I want to capture the full building, I have to move to one side of the pole and to the other side of the pole. I cannot stand still. Um, sometimes you just want to see more of the scene. There is. If you love uh, vehicles or machines like I do, then you want to see both the front and the back. You don't want just to see a single view of the machine. So what do you do then? There is actually no, there's no solution. There's no correct geometrical way in which you can stitch these two images, and they will look smooth and nice. There is no such thing. You can think of what, ha what would happen if you take pictures of a person. So we'll take a picture from here. You will see this side of the nose. Take here, this side of the nose, how do you stitch them? It's not just a transformation. That there, there's no transformation, even nonlinear. That, or maybe there is. I don't want to say something that's strong. But um, probably you cannot get something which looks like, which looks completely good. So people just said, OK, don't move. And we didn't like that. We said, doesn't make sense. Um, and let, again, we started exploring what others have been doing. So we find this piece of work by Michael Collar. 
who's been taking long images of streets in San Francisco. And I've heard so that this is of high interest to you guys. There's also work uh, from Microsoft. I think it came last year or the year before, where they were taking lots of pictures on long streets and then merging them together. And um, these ones actually were done by him manually. So he would take, I think, about 200 pictures for some, something like that. And, uh, and then he would stitch them manually. One thing that you can see that he did is that he cropped off the background. And that's because it's very difficult to make the background align nicely as well as the foreground. So get, getting both things that are close and things that are far look good is difficult. Um, so it's typically cropped. But you can find solutions designed for such a scenario where you know that your scene is more or less flat and you just walk along it. Uh, not that many surprises in terms of structure in the scene. Um, but another idea is uh, something that we found artists do, and that is looking for non-smooth compositions. And the artist David Hockney has been uh, has played with uh, such ideas, I think, in the 80s, and he constructed lots of uh, lots of uh, compositions where he would just take lots of photographs, and at that days he would actually have the actual pictures. And he would manually stitch them uh, and, and compose them into things that look like that, which uh, many people find very compelling. So his work is highly appreciated. And there are many more examples of his work. And you can see, for example, like here, you can see the texture at uh, the bottom of the trees. So you're looking at this from above. And you're seeing things here. Um, some things he does incorrectly in purpose, like I don't know if the resolution allows you to see, but there is a piece of graffiti on the wall. And he put that in front of the tree because he wanted you to, to see what's on the wall. So consistently, he breaks uh, geometrical constraints and put things and places pictures in a way that, that is appealing to the eye and, and intriguing and captures the essence of the scene. Uh, sim I found a similar work by James Bellog that mostly takes uh, trees for some reason. This one looks rather smooth. Um, and it's interesting because this guy, so to get his uh, compositions, he was actually using cables and all kinds of machinery to make them to go up and down next to the tree. And it's interesting to read. And there are many people who are just amateur photographers who are playing with these ideas. Um, you can find them on Flickr. So this is one, and another one. And if you go to Flickr you'll f and you search for tags like Hockney or joiners or um, compositions, photo stitch, you will find hundreds or probably more of, of those. So people are just playing with them. They like them. They're constructing them. And we decided to try and see if we can automate the construction of things like that. So we call them join, or David Hockney called them joiners. Uh, and it turns out that we can, at least to some extent. And what is the idea? Um, we want to align the images. So we're assuming that our images are not completely independent. There are some overlaps between them. Um, and the overlaps are somewhat consistent. They don't have to be completely geometrically correct. We want to align them. Uh, we're going to, al to allow the images uh, to only translate, rotate, and scale um, for two reasons. First, because if you wanted to construct those manually in any image editing software, th these are the, the things you have available. Second, having uh, warping uh, in hand makes it more complicated and sometimes look too confusing. And also, we were thinking of um, treating the pictures as the thing that is object, as the thing that you captured and you want each, you believe that each picture is a nice representation of what you wanted to show, so we don't want to distort it. So we're just translating, rotating, and scaling the images. Um, now, while typical panorama tools align images and then blend them, this blending is not going to work here because things are not going to be that consistent. And this is what you get. Things get blurry when they're not nicely aligned. 
Um, there are other methods to merge images, but all of them will not work well when the images are not perfectly aligned. And in our case, they will not be perfectly aligned. So we're going to layer them rather than um, merge them. We're going to layer them just like in the joiners. Uh, so we choose an order of the images. And while we could just choose a random order, we instead try and find an order which will give us as smooth as possible composition. And this is, um, we do that by observing that, for example, if this is a picture and these are the green or the boundaries of the picture, so we want these boundaries to be consistent. We care less about boundaries here, which are going to be hidden because they're, this is going to be a layer underneath. So this is the trick that actually we're going to use, the fact that we cannot get a globally consistent solution, but we can hide the artifacts as much as we can and get something which looks uh, uh, as good as we, or better than, as good as we can. So this is a summary of the system. It's basically the same, it's very similar to what's being used with uh, standard panoramas. You start with finding features, you match features across images. Once you match features, you align them, and here we're just using translation, rotation, and scale. Uh, but what's different is after we align them, we can look at the different orders of the images. We choose the one that we prefer. This one, in this case, we cancel this one. We decided that this one is nicer. And then we say, OK, this is an important region. Let's try and make things look good here. And we care less about other areas. Uh, let's just look at that step by step. So here's an example of four pictures of, of an airplane. And we start by matching features. And we used uh, David Lowe's SIFT, uh, SIFT matching. But again, there is available software for doing that. And after you match the feature, you can compute the transformation. You get something like that, which is it, it placed the images more or less in the right position. But um, there is, for example, a big discontinuity here and there. If you just change the order of, those, of, the, of these images, you get something like that, which is already smoother. But still, we have, um, so we have discontinuities here and discontinuities here. So here are the. At the engine and at the top of the of the airplane. Um, so now we find those areas that where we have seams, and we try to realign the images by giving these areas more importance. And we're trying to optimize there and give more slack in other areas. Um, so this is done by if we had features in those areas, we give those. You see by the size of the circles how much it means what's their importance. So here we are close to a seam, so the features here have high importance. And well, the other ones got completely buried. There are lots of features here. There are tiny dots because they're not really important. We don't care how good the alignment is there. So we re realign the images to optimize for those areas. We get something like that. So now we have, you see, we have a lot better uh, alignment here at the, the engine and at the top of the airplane, and it looks smoother. So I'll just show you some examples of composition of such joiners that we constructed automatically. So uh, Long Beach Airport, um, Cacti Gar Garden, and Huntington Gardens. And you can see the multiple viewpoints. So we're looking at this from above. So this is the top of the cacti, and you can see the sign. And then you, we went up to take pictures of the long, of the tall cacti cactus. And if you choose the wrong order, what happens is that you get the sign cut in half, and things don't look as smooth. They look over patchy, over fragmented. Um, this one is left, right, top, down. A truck, so that's, that was one of my motivations, to be able to see the front and the back of vehicles, um, the tractor. And they're not, they're not perfect, right? So, there is, so this is not smooth, but they're still rather compelling, I believe. Um, sometimes, the, the, sometimes it doesn't work perfectly, and you need to help it a little bit. So in this case, uh, we had a huge collection of things, something like 50 pictures. And they got split into, we could only stitch more half and half. We couldn't stitch all of them simul together. Um, there is a tree here in front of the bridge. It was impossible to, take, to, to see the full bridge from a single viewpoint. So we're standing here taking some pictures, and then we move to the other side of the tree took the other pictures of the bridge. 
and we could not match them because there were not enough features. So then we marked them manually. I don't know if you can see the yellow dots. So we just marked two points on each side on each composition, and we merged them together. And this is this is a completely impossible bridge. So there is actually a tree here that occludes the tree. So you cannot take a single picture of this bridge. And you can see that the building at the back is here and here. It's the same building. And that's because we changed the viewpoint. Um, OK, so finding features, aligning, uh, and aligning is, is fast. It's just like, and if you have any experience with um, panorama software, it depends on, this, on the resolution of your images and uh, the number of your images. But in the order of, I'd say, minutes, few minutes. It could be less than a minute if you have just a few. It, if you have 50 high resolution images, it would be a few minutes. Um, the ordering of the images currently is very slow, but that's probably my fault. So it shouldn't be. So I have stupid MATLAB code that's not doing things efficiently. Um, I would guess that it, would, it should not add too much to the overall computational cost. So I would say it would still stay in the resolution of a few minutes. Um, just to put this in context, even if it's slow, so um, building something like that manually, so, we, so we've done this. So typically what uh, one of us, so I, I work with uh, Pietro Perona on this, and uh, typically he will take the pictures and do it manually, and I do it automatically. We do it independently. And uh, the last one he did took him 40 minutes to put them in. He's not an artist, right? So he's not doing, but he's trying to get something with, he likes. And it took him 40 minutes to do it. And if um, actually, what one of the things that we would like to do is, even if it's slow, to be able to give you, to let you push a button, we'll give you something that is roughly what you would be looking for. And then you will end up refining it. You might decide that you do want to see the tree here. And we got rid of it. Uh, so you will change. It's, it's completely subjective, but that's the purpose. Yes? Right, so looking at pieces of images makes sense. So probably if we were, if we were willing to cut the images, we could get smoother looking results. Uh, we were thinking also of not just um, cutting them into rect rectangles, but you could also use methods like rough cuts, which are not rectangles. Um, this extra degree of freedom is, at this point, was, over, was too confusing for us. Uh, and, and also, we find some of the compositions look when they're, OK, we found that, at least for us, we had to get a costume to looking at those non-smooth joiners. And when they get over-fragmented, we tend to be confused by them. Um, now, the more you look at, at examples, the simpler they become, the easier they become to you, the more a costume you become, and you're willing to look at more fragmented things. So I know that even artworks of David Hockney that I didn't like a few years ago, I do like them now. I can, I can handle them. So maybe the next phase will do things like that. It's quite possible. Uh, we had some art reproduction, reproduction. So this is the fun part. So this is a, a fresco by Paolo Cello, which is it's very famous because I think he did it like three or four times. And uh, there are debates why. But this one is, not, <clears throat> is incorrect. So you look at the pedestal from below, while the rider and horse are looked from a side view. So it's, it's inconsistent. But, and there was, there was a debate whether he just didn't know what he was doing, or rather he knew exactly what he was doing. And he wanted to, so you see the pedestal from below. So there is, uh, it gives you the sense of, oh, like you're looking up to the rider. And then if you look at the person from below, they don't look that great. So you see the person from the side view. Uh, this is my reconstruction of the same thing. So this is my pedestal. You see the horse from below and from the top. You can see its mane. And the rider is seen from a side view. And this way, actually, if I were to blend it and, and um, fix the contrast, and adjust the contrast, it would look almost perfectly smooth, uh, even though it's multiple viewpoints. Um, this one is an example. OK, so maybe I should show this one first. So I found this one on Flickr, and I liked it. And I contacted the person who took the pictures and asked him, can I get the originals? And he sent them to me. So this is what I got, and this is what he got. It's not exactly the same, but I think this could be 
a good starting point if you were to do it. So I think his smoke is a lot better than mine, mostly. And, and the alignment that he got is better, but we're not far from it. Um, another example, so, three, so these are, so David Hockney did a lot of those, so he has the whole project where he took p photographs of people and he was just moving uh, up and down and stitching them. So we did a few of those. Um, this is Patrick Hughes. And uh, you can see that the background is, is non-consistent. So the background repeats. But people look interesting. Uh, and then finally, we thought that this could be a, a way to also, if you don't, if you're not into the artistic part of the story, uh, and you're more looking more for useful things. So you can think of that as a better way to organize your picture. So you took lots of pictures in the same place or of the same person. Um, you could organize them like that. And then when, as you move your mouse, you will see the corresponding pictures open up. Uh, and I think I actually have that um, online. Let's see if that works for me. So let's see. I think that like I click here and I okay they're not a perfect resolution, but um, you can click on the different regions. You can see the head, you can see the foot, all the photographs of the foot, and so forth. So this could be an, a different way for browsing your your photographs and organize them in a more geometrically. Uh, consistent way. And then in this case, obviously, you're not looking for something that looks perfectly smooth. You just want to have your photographs organized. And this is more or less what we're providing. So OK, I think this was um, will this take me to the beginning? No. OK, so I think this is it. So just. Um, so I showed you a couple of things here. Um, I think the, the main thing I want to say uh, in doing those compositions is that people tend to look for correct solutions and things that are smooth and, and, and bright. And, um, and that's not always necessarily the best thing you can do or for some applications, for some usages, for some reasons, sometimes things which are wrong can be correct or better for you. Um, and another thing is that when you were doing those constructions of panoramas and compositions, it's not a pure geometrical problem. You must look at the context. So if you have people there, you might want to do one thing. If you have buildings, you might want to do something else. Um, it's not something that you can just do by have a general algorithm that works for all images, unless you really know what the content is. And that's something that uh, not, has not been explored that much. And I think people should look into that. So yeah, that's, that's all I have to say today. Um, okay, so is there anything that we can do with uh, an arbitrarily moving camera? I hope I got the question right. Uh, were you thinking also of people moving in the scene or just the camera moving more flick? So, okay, so the examples I showed, the last set of examples I showed, the camera was moving. It's not just single viewpoint, but not a lot. So it's not an exploration of, like, I cannot just walk around this building, take pictures and, and stitch them. Um, we haven't touched that yet. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have a good answer. So it could be that for some cases, doing something like that would work. But if, so if you were to walk along a scene and just take pictures, probably if I just put them one next to the other, it would be more or less, it would be one kind of representation, but maybe it's not a good one. Um, another idea would be, OK, there's, there's something, that, an idea that we are discussing is completely preliminary, and uh, it's 
to think of this as some kind of origami. So you have a set of planes that you will use, and pieces of the pictures that you took will be assigned to those planes, and then you will somehow have to put merge those planes. So like multi-level. So here I had just one canvas, and I tried to put images that were taken by moving camera on that canvas. And there I will have many, maybe a few such canvases, and I will try and merge them somehow. Maybe. I'm, I'm not saying this is necessarily good, but yeah. In your multi-planar reconstruction or first projection, is that fully automated, where you just give it the spherical image, and then it selects the appropriate plane cuts based on minimizing so, um, so right now, no. The examples I showed you here were done manually. We clicked on the points where you wanted to inter the the planes to intersect. Um, we do have software that automates that. The way the, our software doesn't. Um, so it looks at two things. It looks. It tries to infer the geometrical structure in the scene. So we look for lines. We try to find the vanishing points, and then we try to place the intersections there. Um, and then also we look at homogeneous regions. So if their regions are homogeneous or just textured and we wouldn't care, we like those. And then we give, so we look at the cylindrical one and we kind of give each possible column uh, a grade and we choose the best ones. So we do have software that does that. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm somehow I wrote this software and I'm not convinced anyone will ever want to use it. Just because it's just, you know, when you do two clicks and you get exactly what you want, maybe it's better to do the two clicks. Um, I could offer you a few options, but then you'll want to refine them. I don't know. That's, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so uh, we don't do, uh, we haven't done any contrast matching so far uh, on purpose. and. Um, just it's it is so subjective. So probably if we were if we were to do that, you will get smoother looking results, but you will change the the pictures. Um, you can actually find many examples. So okay, so we we take most of our motivation from from the things we find on Flickr, just because these are it's not us, it's other people who are constructing them, and many people are actually playing with focus and defocus. So. So you, you can see, find maybe ones where you have um, a table and a coffee cup. And everything is blurred, just the cup is in focus. Um, you could, so, and there are algorithms which let you defocus images. There are, and sometimes you'll have dissimilar effects with darkened areas and lighter areas. So we didn't touch it. We felt this would be too subjective. Maybe, maybe at some point, but. You can get you can get cyclic. Well, only if you allow if it's a rigid plane, then you actually and it's not. Oh, you mean like going yeah. on a cylinder? Um, so this actually, um, yeah, it will. So oh, no, I don't have it online. So there is an example where I had some. So we had pictures taken full 360 degrees, and rather than getting something straight, I got a circle. Yes. So you're right. Well, thank you.